tonight an incredible story of survival. And then all of a sudden we just saw like one huge wave that actually came over the top end of the motor. Three fishermen thrown into the sea. I'm in hysterics. No way to call for help. No land in sight. Their fears. You got sharks, you got barracudas. Their family. We may have slept an hour. I, I, don't, I don't remember sleeping. The desperate search to find them. We didn't have much information to go on at all. A survival story so powerful, we're dedicating an entire hour. Lost at Sea starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Wall. For brothers John and Elias Navarez, fishing is a passion. And it didn't take long for John's girlfriend, Becca, to get hooked, too. The three Navy sailors set out from this ramp in Mayport on a borrowed boat bound for a day of fishing off the coast. They had hoped that they would come back with another great fishing tale, but instead they returned with a story about surviving. Three days lost at sea, and for the first time, we are hearing all of their untold story. The weather was actually really nice. What we were fishing for, anything. The spot that we were headed to was 9.8 miles, so rounded to 10. 10 miles off the coast, a little bit due north of the Jacksonville area. John Navarez, his girlfriend Becca Sullivan, and John's younger brother Elias in a 20-foot boat following one of the charter boats offshore to a fishing hole. And you weren't intimidated by going that far off in, in a boat that wasn't a big charter boat? The boat no. that, we, that we took in the Keys, we'd used it to go 20, 25 miles off the coast. The waves weren't really a big concern. The, I mean, the boat handled very well. The three passing time during the hour-long ride by singing. Elias started. He was singing the theme song to uh, Gilligan's, Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. She started singing along. <laughs> I mean, I was driving the boat and I was like, ah, it's stuck in my head now. <laughs> well, they started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. Never imagining the song would soon turn into their own real life wreck, beginning with a decision they would soon regret. It was already getting warm, so everybody started stripping sweaters off, and the life vest came off with the sweaters, and they got stowed in a kitty cabin. They reached their fishing spot and have just thrown their lines in the water. John and Elias were fishing off the back, and uh, I wasn't really. I mean, I wasn't really paying attention. And then all of a sudden, we just saw like one huge wave that actually came over the top end of the motor. And as he turned to turn the key, second wave washed on, and the motor actually went under the water at that point. I jumped up and ran to the actual bow of the boat, trying to equal out how much weight we had in the back. I tried to call Mayday, and I saw that the lights were on. And right when I went to key the mic, all the lights went off on the radio. So I knew the battery had been wet. From the motor starting to sink to the boat completely flipping, eight to 10 seconds. John manages to grab their cooler before the boat capsizes end over end. I'm in hysterics. I'm like, I panic. The, oh crap, what just happened? It ran through everybody's head. You know, everybody's initial fear is that Jaws is gonna come out of the bottom and just tear you in half and all the stories you hear about the Indianapolis where their bodies were just eaten you wake up in the morning there'd be half a body bobbing in the water those thoughts kind of go through your head pushing the idea of sharks out of their mind for the moment the three take a quick inventory Elias is wearing a bright orange shirt it could be used to signal for help they have their cooler inside is a case of water one large Gatorade their bait a bag of squid and ice Becca also found a plastic bag in the water, which she tied around her wrist. All of it would now be used to help them survive. First, how are they going to stay afloat without exhausting themselves? We vented kind of a line and pulley system to where we were able to, we yanked all the anchor line out of the boat and we used it to tie ourselves to the boat. Were you afraid that it was going to pull you down though if it sank? being attached to the boat with yeah. well I mean at first we were um, so we made sure that the loops were big enough that we could swim out of um, if we needed to let me show you what they did next using the anchor line obviously we're outside of the water but they 
had to figure out a way to, to rest. So they'd create a human chair basically in the water. The rope would be used to support their back. They'd put their feet up like this on the boat creating this chair. One person then could lay right on top of them and be out of the water enough to take a break and rest. Alternating with the chair technique also meant less kicking, which hopefully would keep them from attracting sharks. So we weren't drawing much attention to ourselves. We were really just something floating along the water. I mean, and really would have to be something large and very, uh, you know, I don't know, bored and in, interested in something floating in the water to attack it. They had been in the water just two hours when they spotted their first chance of rescue, a boat. Screaming, I was like standing up as best I could on the boat, uh, you know, waving my arms. And I mean, you could see him. Shirt. You could well, see you could the guy see, in the boat. You were so close, you could see the guy in the bridge of the boat. But he never saw them. But Jamie didn't get a call. And then she came over and asked if either one of us had contact with them and we're like, no, why would we, you know? John and Elias's and stepfather says Elias's wife was the first to suspect something was wrong when she hadn't heard from him by late that afternoon. Then... My brother-in-law was supposed to rendezvous with them at the Durant and no kids, no guys, no boat, no nothing. Becca's Durango and the boat trailer were still parked at the ramp. The final sign, it was time to call the Coast Guard. And the more we worked the case, the more we, we became concerned because we didn't have much information to go on at all. Captain Andy Bloom says first they called all the marinas and radioed boats still out on the water asking if they'd seen the boat or its three passengers. To make matters worse, the Coast Guard had very little to go on for a search. Really, almost nothing. There was not a good description of the vessel. There was not a good time of departure. Um, there wasn't a good uh, description of where they were going. They work any disappearance on the water, much like a detective trying to find a missing person looking now for clues. They found one inside Becca's truck, a receipt to a local tackle shop, which led them here. What kind of bait did they buy? And based on that information, we said, well, what kind of fish is going, going after that type of bait? And where do those people usually fish to go there? And, with, and that being the only information we've got to go on, that's where we began to work our search. We went out and focused our first helicopter search in this area where you see the orange uh, triangles. The problem, the three had been floating in the water for hours and are well north of where the Coast Guard begins its search. In the water, trouble now approaches. John and Elias are helpless as a large wave of jellyfish rolls right into them. Something hit me in the back of the leg and I swore that thing felt like electricity. It, that's how bad it stung. I almost jumped out the water, actually. They'd smack against you, they'd wrap their tentacles around you, and you'd feel millions and millions of stingers all over the place. It hurt really bad. There is nothing they can do to avoid it. John's thoughts now turn to their water supply. He looked at how much we had and just decided, hey, drink this much of the bottle and then pass to the next person. Rationing it as best they can. Becca is now getting cold. The plastic bag she found becomes useful. So I put it on his head like a hat with the holes over his ears and I would stick my hands underneath the bag like on top of his head and I would warm up from the heat coming off his head. And you lose a lot of your heat through your head. The little bit of water that was in there plus the heat of your body, the heat of the sun would cause it to warm up and the bag would be you know, 20, 30 degrees warmer than what your body was feeling. Was there a lot of talking or were you saving your energy? <laughs> a lot of jokes, a lot of comedy, yeah. a lot of movies. Did you see this movie? Just anything to keep our minds off of the actual event. If you just sit quietly, A, you know, you get tired, you want to go to sleep and you're going to drown, you know. B, it just kind of keeps everybody because, you know, you, you sit back and you just start thinking and get into that despair mode. And if you give someone a chance to do that, they're a lost cause. Seven hours in the water, it's now dark. Concerns about sharks start to creep back into their mind. You know, it was one of the first things we checked for after we knew nightfall was coming was, you know, anyone cut themselves while clearing the boat or anything like that. Blood's going to draw sharks and, and anything else, you know. In Florida waters, you got sharks, you got barracudas, and they can tear up some skin if they get near you. 
They are also watching a storm in the distance. The waves now so choppy, their bodies are getting slammed up against the boat. Oh, you really only get like a 10 second cat nap before the next wave slaps you. They're tired and hungry. Becca is starting to lose hope. It's depressing. They're just getting beat up by these waves. It's the middle of the night. It's cold. There's not, you know, you're hungry because you haven't eaten all day. You're thirsty because, you know, the salt just like seeps inside I won't of let your them skin. Drink. Becca worries she may never see her four year old daughter again. When we would see the Coast Guard helicopters and planes flying by, but nowhere near close enough. When we come back, a parent's agony. I, I don't I don't remember sleeping. I know she never slept. And I, I didn't she didn't sleep. I don't even remember eating, tell you the truth. She was worried she was gonna lose her two her two boys. It'd be three boys in twenty one months. Once the sun finally came up, which is the most beautiful thing you could ever see in the world, followed shortly by fins in the water, which is the scariest thing in the world. Those fins turn towards them. Next. Becca, her boyfriend John, and his brother Elias have just survived their first night floating in the ocean after two waves flooded their boat as they fished off the coast of Mayport. From the motor starting to sink to the boat completely flipping, eight to ten seconds, I mean, it, it, was, it was fast. The 20-foot boat was equipped with all the safety features except an emergency position indicating radio beacon known as an EPIRB. That is going to give us the position we need to zero in. But without one, the Coast Guard has a much more difficult search. We generally centered it from about looking at the size of the boat and where they were fishing from about 15 miles north of the inlet to 15 miles south, going out about 30 miles. So a big rectangle out there. That's a very big rectangle. It is a very big rectangle. Yeah. And, and one of the things, and that shows you the challenge that's created when we don't have any idea where to search. The three have now been in the water for more than 20 hours. No life vests, no flares, no food, and realizing finding them could be like a needle in a haystack. We knew we hadn't told anyone exactly where we were going. They have only their cooler filled with a case of water and one Gatorade. Clinging to their capsized boat, they have survived the stings of dozens of jellyfish. And I swore that thing felt like electricity. It, that's how bad it stung. And what lurks beneath the surface of the ocean at night. Once the sun finally came up, which is the most beautiful thing you could ever see in the world, <laughs> followed shortly by fins in the water, which is the scariest thing in the world. Those fins begin to circle them. I actually it was on the other side of the boat, so I, I didn't see them, but they told me about it, and we kind of stayed close to the boat and avoided making anything that might attract whatever it was. No kicking, no splashing, just stay still. What is that few seconds like? I'm it's, waiting and wondering. It's, there's just nothing you can do. You know, you just stay quiet and stay still and just hope whatever it is isn't dangerous, or if it is, then it's not curious enough to come find out what you are. Now within arm's reach, Becca sees they're dolphins, not sharks. But it wasn't long before a real shark, a pup, does get close. It came up and like would start nipping at us. It'd pull at our, like I had pants on, so it'd start nipping at my pants. It, I her heard, hair. Yeah, it pulled on my hair because my hair was floating on top of the ocean. I reached around, and I grabbed it, and I shook it a little bit, and it swam away. They knew more could be close. They needed to be extremely careful every time they opened their cooler to drink. Their bait from fishing is still inside. We'd bring water bottles out. We'd kind of shake it and make sure it dripped down into the cooler before we'd start drinking it. We wanted to make sure nothing came out of the cooler. But the smell of squid when it starts to warm up, horrible. And then it would seep into the water bottles. Yeah. They knew if only they had their life vests and their flares, they had a much better chance of being found. Both were floating right underneath them in the cabin of their boat. But reaching them was a tremendous risk. When I said we'll dive the boat, go inside the cabin, Elias was like, that's just stupid. Yeah, no. 
We've all, and we've at, all said no. At that point, you know, just talking out loud, you're just thinking out loud, and then everybody else is like, no, that's not a good idea. The worry about diving under a boat is that this door could shut closed while he's underwater. The other thing, just opening it, remember it's capsized, all the air could come out. And that means that he could get trapped inside and it could sink with him in there. Diving the back half of the boat was something they thought was safe enough to retrieve their small cooler. It was an open area on the back end of the boat. We didn't, there was nothing to get caught on or, or tangled up in. So we decided that was a good idea, which was a good idea. It had, all, had more Gatorade, more water in that cooler also that helped out. That dive a success. They now have three large bottles of Gatorade. It was a relief. It helped a lot because the electrolytes and all the extras that are in Gatorade, I think is what actually helped us most. After hours of debating it, the three make a major decision to leave the boat. We saw what looked like an offshore rig of some sort that didn't seem like it was that far away. But we couldn't see land anymore at all. So eventually we just decided that maybe our best bet is to try to swim for this tower with our coolers. They know how to maneuver a boat. They know what they're doing on a boat. Something happened to the boat and they're just drifting, you know. Being capsized was never a thought. I... Now into the second day of their disappearance, John and Elias' stepfather talking about how he and their mom are trying to hold it together. We may have slept an hour. I, I, don't, I don't remember sleeping. I know she never slept. I, I, I didn't, she didn't sleep. I don't even remember eating, tell you the truth. The boy's mother, shaken. She had just recently buried her youngest son, and now this. It was exactly 21 months to the day that the boys were missing. We lost Chris, and, uh, and Chris was a Marine. 21-year-old Chris Navarez had died in a motorcycle accident. His mother still too emotional to be interviewed. <sighs> Oof. Uh, it, it rocked it to the core. It really did. It, was, it, was, it, it still is. It's not, it's not over. You know? uh, it's hard every day. There's nothing that happens that a thought of him doesn't come by. I want to see you walking around. Now, with Chris's dog Wrangler by their side, hope is holding them up. John and Elias know they have to hang on. My mom, I you know, she's been through a lot, and so I, you know, to to lose both me and my brother would just devastate her, and I couldn't do that to her. These three, those three, the two black. This one, this one, and this one is what we basically covered at night. The Coast Guard Command Center plotting all their search areas on this map. We had helicopters, the H-60 helicopter that we that flew all the way over from uh, Saint, from our air station in uh, Clearwater. We were using helicopters that flew down from Air Station Savannah. We had our local 87-foot uh, patrol boat, the Kingfisher. Uh, we had local law enforcement, uh, uh, state folks that were out looking, helping us. By now, the Coast Guard has searched the waters 30 miles due east of Mayport. The shoreline is far north as Fernandina Beach and as far south as St. Augustine. We knew they were uh, in the United States Navy. We knew uh, that they, they should be, uh, you know, reasonably fit. And so that gave us hope. We had er every confidence that if anyone could make it through, that they could. Knowing John and Elias, and how they are. I knew if there was something wrong, they could handle it. The three are now swimming for a tower they believe is six to eight miles away. Myself and Becca were towing the larger cooler. My little brother was using the smaller cooler. What they hadn't realized was the ocean's power. Um, so I was moving faster than they were, and so I would have to stop, but the issue that we kept having was the currents. So I would stop, but the current would take me further away from them or in a different direction from them. When we come back... I kept kicking and kicking and kicking and kicking, and I looked back, and they were nowhere to be seen. And... I've heard her say it. I've heard you know, mothers that have lost their, their children have uh, said it, that there's a, a loss of breath, a gasp that they feel. And um, when Christopher got hurt, she felt it. A mother's intuition. Next.
Elias, John, and Becca have now been floating in the water for nearly 40 hours. They have abandoned the capsized boat they had been clinging to and are swimming towards a tower they see off in the distance. The Coast Guard is searching for them, but the three never told anyone exactly where they were going that day, so the search is a large area. 1,500 square miles off the coast of Northeast Florida and Southeast Georgia. Their decision to leave the boat is dangerous. It's one of the greatest challenges we have to find someone is a person in the water. You know, if they can at least stay with the boat, we have so much, it's so much easier to see a boat from 500 feet above the water in a helicopter than to see, essentially, if you can imagine a, hit, a basketball bobbing in the water from 500 feet away. The three believe the tower is just six to eight miles away. We had all day to do it. We left the boat at noon. So we had, you know, probably a good eight hours of sunlight to be able to make the swim there. Except the current is just too powerful. And at one point, uh, me just not paying attention to where they were, I kept kicking and kicking and kicking and kicking, and I looked back, and they were nowhere to be seen. Elias is separated from the group. He's all alone. That moment of dread definitely hit. Um, you know, they had all the water, they had all the Gatorade. Um, I just had a cooler and me. I couldn't believe it that I let them get, I got that far away from them. How do you not panic then at that moment? You're all alone, no water. I don't even, I couldn't even begin to tell you how you don't do it. I just, I just didn't, you know, we, I knew that we, we'd agreed that we were going to swim towards a specific place. I figured if I keep swimming that way, got to come across them again some, at some point. And the only thing that can really keep you from freaking out about it was, well, hopefully he got to the tower, he can call the SOS. In the back of your mind, you know that's not true, but all together, it's the only thing you can really hope for. For the brothers' family, it was knowing they were together that was keeping them positive. John, you know, he's as strong as an ox. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, if, if it came down to him holding you for the rest of his life, he probably would. He, if, if it meant him and you, he was going to keep you out of, the, out of trouble. So I knew that whatever happened, they're going to take care of it. Hours pass. Elias has not had anything to drink. He's cold, and it's now dark. What I was doing was uh, the wind had picked up, it was getting chilly, um, and started getting a headache from the cold air on the, my head. So I would kind of flip the cooler upside down and bob underneath and just stick my head in the cooler and so kind of keep it out of the wind. As if it couldn't get any worse for him. At some point, um, I bobbed under to get my head out of the wind and just a wave knocked the cooler out of my hand and I had lost the cooler completely. At some point, do you just say, I can't do it anymore? I can't move my arms. I can't move my legs anymore. I'm just so tired. Yeah, it comes across your mind. But then you think about why you're kicking and why you're swimming for it. You want to keep moving, hoping that somebody will find you. I just rolled over my back and floated on my back as best I could and kept moving and just, you know, stuck with it. Figured, you know, as long as I'm moving, I'm alive and, and, and I, I still have a chance. In his darkest hour, Elias now thinking of his wife. I just picture her face and her smile. Everything about family and everything you've done with your family comes across your mind because you got nothing but time. I've heard her say it. I've heard you know, mothers that have lost their, their children have uh, said it. Elias and John's stepdad says their mom was relying on intuition as she waited for news of her boys. There's a, a loss of breath, a gasp that they feel. And um, when Christopher got hurt, she felt it. She didn't feel it with the boys. Having already lost one son in a motorcycle accident, her heart telling her not to give up hope. And that's one of the things she kept saying, goes, I don't feel it, I don't feel it. And I said, well, you know, it's not gonna happen. You know, it, 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 they'll be all right, they're all right. It's now been 12 hours since the current separated Elias from John and Becca. The couple now sees a series of lights in front of them that has them convinced they're reaching land. So we get close enough to one of the lights and I start screaming towards said on quote unquote beach. And I'm like, hey, is anybody out there? And somebody replies. So I was like, Shine your flashlight so I know exactly where you're at. Unbelievable twist of fate. And of course Elias goes, if I had a damn flashlight, we would have been rescued by now. <laughs> of course I hoped it was a boat, but uh, it wasn't my luck. 
It happened to be John and Becca. <laughs> Somehow, in the pitch dark, in the middle of the ocean, separated for half a day, the currents bring them back together again. Finding them was a great moment. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I pretty much counted myself as a loss till I found them again with the cooler. Perhaps their bad luck was now changing. Becca sees something off in the distance. I'm like, hey guys, there's a helicopter. And they're like, no, no, there's not. You know, you're seeing things. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I looked again and I listened. And I'm like, no, that's that's an actual helicopter. You can see you can the see part it. of the ocean where their light was hitting, and they were behind us a good ways. So we're trying to swim, kind of to catch up. And we're like 30 yards away from them, and they turn off. What and it's just like, to your <laughs> trying to keep going? I mean, it was like, yes, we're gonna be found. We're going home. Da 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 da. -da. And then all of a sudden, it's like, are you serious? God. Are you turning right now? Like, you're right there. That helicopter was doing what's called a sweep search. This is a map of all the search patterns the Coast Guard conducted. The black parallel lines indicate a distance of four miles of ocean between the helicopter's back and forth search. John, Becca, and Elias are floating just outside that sweep. As the sun rises on their third day, no land in sight, their hopes of reaching the orange tower are now dwindling. No matter where we position ourselves, as the current would shift, we would get closer, 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 and then fly right by. Exhausted, hungry, and dehydrated, John is fading. Towards daybreak is about where I broke. He's sick from a jellyfish stinger. As the water came into my mouth, a stinger got far enough down to where it felt like this whole section down here was just engorged, swollen. When we come back... My throat was swollen. I knew how much we had left to drink, and I was consuming more than my share. I was worried that at some point he'd just let go and, and you know, and, and just drown. The struggle to keep John alive, next. It's been three days since John, Becca, and Elias have had anything to eat. Water and Gatorade have kept them alive so far. They have not seen land in more than a day, and they've decided to give up trying to swim for an orange tower they had been trying to reach for the last 24 hours. I think the closest we got was maybe a mile. Um, and then I would look up, and we were further away, and I'm like, hey, we're, we're further away. So you conserve your energy? And he's like, no, no, we're not swim 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 no we're definitely further away now so that's when we change tactics john is now also sick he has swallowed a jellyfish stinger as the water came into my mouth a stinger got far enough down to where it felt like this whole section down here was just engorged swollen the only thing that relieves the pain is their water and lots of it i knew how much we had left to drink and I was consuming more than my shift. So I was trying to tough it out, but at the same time knew that I was gonna bring them down. Were you worried you were gonna lose your brother that day? I was, you know, I, I was worried that at some point he'd just let go and, and you know, and, and just drown. And John trying to will himself into holding on, thinking of his young daughter. A few times he let go of the cooler and we'd stop swim over to him, we'll get him back on and keep going. What kinds of things do you say to your brother at that moment? Uh, just you tell him how much you love him and that he can't give up. I mean, you know, he's your brother, you know. That's, that's really all it comes down to. He's your brother, he's family, and you're not going to let him give up. The three now come up with another plan. John was the major one. He, he had us all convinced that this dark cloud on the horizon area was actually a building. The clouds would kind of have like shades inside of them, the grayish dark color. They would look like roads. And you'd be like, well, that has to be something. Because look, there's a road right there. That's the building right there. As we looked at it, we're like, 
you know what? He might be right. It looks like it. Let's go for it. And we swam and we swam and swam. And then the entire time we're swimming to them, we're talking about what we're going to do. We don't know where we're at, but hey, there's the beach and we're going to go, you know, get a hotel room and room service and a hot shower and a bed. And well, we got to the buildings and they disappeared around us. A devastating blow. Those buildings, the road, they were all hallucinations. Anything that we saw, we just, it was your a mind landmark. wants to believe that that's, you know, you see a little flash of light, it's a UFO. <laughs> we saw a little, what looked like a tree line and we were like, small island, let's go, that's great. I mean, if anything, at least we're just out of the water. And you make of it what your, you know, your mind makes of it as what it wants to see. What now? The three are exhausted. They already had spent a day trying to swim towards an orange tower that was too far to reach. Before that, they had endured a storm that had beat their bodies up against their capsized boat to the point they just couldn't hold on anymore. Then their struggle to swim towards land turned out to be a wasted effort. The buildings and roads they had seen were just a figment of their imagination. Now, their last ditch effort was to swim towards what they thought might be shipping lanes. Me and Becca decided, you know what? Boats were passing through that other area that we're at. Let's swim back over there. We have a better chance of somebody coming, coming across somebody. A decision that would become a lifesaver. Becca spots a boat and it's close. Even that for a second is like a boat. No, no, really a boat. There's a boat there. You know, at that point, Becca was like, we, you know, she's yelling, waving arms, and I took my right arm shirt off and just started swinging it as best I could Help. over our heads, and, and then, uh, lo and behold, the boat stopped. Like he was when he going... coasted by, it was like, damn it! And then when the boat turned off, it was like, I think he saw us, and we're like, really? And then he turned, and it was like, he saw us. We're like, yes, yes. <laughs> And then he turned towards us and came closer and, oh, it was the biggest relief. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's all we could say was thank you. And I mean, it's just, it's a moment of relief that you could not believe. The captain was like, holy crap, I can't believe I found you guys out here. What are you here. doing? What are you guys here? doing out here? Oh, nothing, just hanging out. <laughs> For the first time in three days, John, Becca, and Elias are out of the ocean. Yeah, Coast Guard, this is the vessel Tent Frank. Uh, just picked up three survivors out of the water. I wonder if somebody can come out here and get them from me. The call Captain Andy Bloom has been hoping he'd receive. I think I remember him saying, hey, I think I found those people you were looking for. I was like, I mean, as a search and rescue professional, that's, you can't hear anything better than that. Uh, these people were holding on to a cooler and have been in the water for three days. Yeah, Coast Guard does a roger on the medical. One has a throat problem, and the other two are badly uh, exposed and dehydrated. Vessel reporting three survivors of the Coast Guard Sector Charleston. Roger, Captain, I need a little more information on the medical injury. Can you tell me if that throat problem or any of the medical issues are immediate? Yeah, Coast Guard, uh, the medical is not urgent, is not urgent. Then the call to family. And it was like, that was it. They found them, not who they are or how they are, where they are, nothing. It was, they found them. Cautious optimism at first, then. Another 10 or 15 minutes, uh, they're alive, they're on a boat, and they're okay. And that was the message. To know that this is the opposite, that we can call up and, you know, say your, your loved ones are safe and uh, we're, we're going to have them in shortly, it's, it's as good as it gets. The minute we got on the boat, it was just like, I just can't wait to get home now. You know, it's just, after all of this, just getting home was like the most next, the exciting thing possible. It's like Christmas morning. She passed out yeah. and was asleep. Like the minute... It was like, game done. I can go to rest. Good night. See you guys tomorrow. Let me know when the Coast Guard gets here. Elias was in and out, like, kind of like a dreaming baby where you wake up and it's like, we're good. Back to sleep. I just felt better that we were going to live. When we come back. Our veins were pretty much collapsed. Uh, 
her eyeballs. Yeah, my, my eyes were sunburned. Getting them medical attention and their first steps on land. The fishing boat 10th frame has just pulled John, Becca, and Elias out of the ocean. These people were holding on to a pool and have been in the water for three days. The Coast Guard sends one of its boats to pick them up. Another boater captures the exchange on this video. I mean, just the minute we got on the boat, it was just like, I just can't wait to get home now. You know, it's just after all of this, just getting home was like the most next, the exciting thing possible. It's like Christmas morning. The three had been floating in the ocean for 72 hours. Much of that time spent fantasizing what they'd eat and drink at this very moment. Yeah, Elias He wanted a beer. a beer, he Elias promised. Wanted a beer. He's like, the first thing I'm gonna do is drink a beer, and then after that, they can take me to the hospital, I'm fine. And he had one sip of his beer. And checked it over. And <laughs> checked it right over, because he was, it would, I mean, it burned his mouth. The three underestimating just how sick they are. Your mouth Even the water and burns taste your mouth. buds are so dehydrated that they swell and everything feels like a million paper cuts. So soda hurt, water hurt, we couldn't eat very much. Our mouths were so dehydrated. So everything tasted like literally sandpaper, sand and just hurt putting it in. It was too risky for the Coast Guard medical team to start hydrating them with IVs. So they would have to wait till they reach land. They had floated so far away from where they went in the water, 10 miles due east of Mayport. They were now 54 miles north of there and had drifted an additional 20 miles further out to sea. They were found 30 miles off the coast of Brunswick. It would take seven hours by boat to reach Mayport. At last, land. Elias is the first to step on solid ground. He is exhausted his legs like jello, his face peeling from sunburn, emotional from just seeing his family, and gingerly walking straight to a waiting ambulance. My mom and my dad came on the boat to see us. And the image that kept him kicking was now real, his wife. Yeah, I got to see my wife, which is ecstatic, I'm sure. I know I was crying, you know, just, you know, never expected something like this to happen. And then when it happens, you know, don't hear many people after three days being found alive so it was just one of those things that you know pure amazement that we were there john was next his arms so sore from holding their cooler he could hardly move them except to muster up the strength to reach out to his aunt before walking to the ambulance give everybody a hug you were so happy to see them so emotional about seeing them that you didn't have any emotion left. I mean, literally the whole ride from flip over to being rescued was, we'd used everything. Yeah. I mean, you'd used every bit of will, mental capacity, strength, emotion. power, emo everything that you could do to convince yourself that you were gonna live, you'd used it. The brother's father talking that night about having his sons back. They're very tired. They were, uh, the jellyfish were eating their legs, of course, and. Um, they stayed positive and they, they stuck to a plan. They both, all of them are Navy, so uh, we thank God that they're strong swimmers and, and they, didn't, they didn't lose any hope and, they, and, and today God has delivered them back home. Finally, Becky emerges, too tired to walk on her own, her lips so sunburned she could barely speak. I had what could almost be considered a second degree sunburn on my face. My face, once I had actually gotten to the hospital and everything, was hard, like like hard, like plastic hard. Um, and so swollen, like my face was stretched out, it was like this big. And neck. Nose, neck, uh, her eyeballs. Yeah, my, my eyes were sunburned. These are pictures of Becca snapped during her stay in the hospital, treated for dehydration and severe sunburn. Elias and I were pretty torn up. He had a big, huge abrasion across his neck. This from the jellyfish. From the jellyfish and the ropes. I had another one along my back. I had a scar on my head. You on know, your arms? Uh, my arms were all torn up from the ropes. Our veins were pretty much collapsed. I mean, we'd, we'd suffered quite a bit. Two days on IV fluids in the hospital, 
and the three were released. The waves that hit us, the first one was in the upper six to seven, it looked huge. And the one that finally capsized the boat was even larger than the first. Sharing their amazing story of survival during this news conference. What our drinking plan was gonna be, we stuck to it to the T. At no given point did anybody complain that they were thirsty. We monitored each other's vitals at all times. <clears throat> Everything as insignificant as how many times they used the restroom to as important to coughing, breathing hard, exhaustion, falling asleep. John emotional as he described the moment he began to lose hope. I had worked myself to the point where I was physically and mentally exhausted. I was no longer able to be in command of our little group. My little brother, Rebecca, took over. I didn't want to go down without him. I wasn't going to let him fall behind. And, you know, we were going to do whatever we could to stay together on that cooler until rescue came. Their families in awe of what they did to survive. After all, no one knew until they stepped on shore that they had been in the ocean for three days. John and Elias's stepdad thought they had just been drifting in the boat. We didn't know about the cooler until they arrived. Smart engineering. <laughs> everything, use everything you got. Those years at uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs in Virginia swimming paid off. George Carrasquillo still cannot believe their sheer luck that second day when the ocean's currents pulled Elias away from his brother and Becca, only to reunite them 12 hours later. They were separated, and then in the middle of in the middle of the ocean in dark, they find each other while there's planes flying above them and helicopters that can't find each other, you know? So that was, that's, you know, that was pretty cool. Such an unbelievable story. Their stepdad jokes now about making it into a movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, John Lucasama will play uh, Elias, and the, the fisherman that picked them up, I picked uh, Joe Pesci. And then there's the one, the, the scene uh, with, uh, where the boys uh, find each other, and they are uh, like talking back and forth. Do you have a flashlight? Well, I have uh, Robin Williams in there doing a cameo and stuff like that. <laughs> what about I, Becca? Did she get? Oh, yeah, Becca is the. Who did I pick for Becca? Oh, oh somebody Fox, the Foxy Girl. For Elias, he has yet another reason to keep smiling. His baby girl was born last year, a new kind of joy for him and his wife. He still loves to fish, though he doesn't have much time to throw in a line off his favorite Mayport Pier. He's no longer in the Navy, but spends 11 months of the year in Afghanistan working as a military contractor. I, I guess it takes a lot to shock me now. You know, I mean, um, working in Afghanistan, you know, we have uh, incoming missile fire here and there, and I see people go into a cold sweat panic, and I'm sitting there like, cool as a cucumber. It's like, you're going to need to do a lot more to shock me. For John and Becca, they're still together and joke that they know more about each other than most couples. They say life for them is better. It takes a lot to get me upset now. I mean, there's nothing as bad as that. There's nothing as bad as what we've been through. And you'd think after everything they endured, jellyfish, sharks, starvation, that John, Becca, and Elias might stick to fishing from shore from now on. How soon were you out on the water again? A week. Right away. It was a week. <laughs> right away. It was a week. It was, thought it was literally. We, shouldn't do this? we only no. waited longer because our mom would have killed us. <laughs> Elias's wife wasn't thrilled about the idea either. In fact, I was not supposed to go fishing ever again, uh, but we worked that one out. <laughs> now I'm not allowed to go fishing or on a boat without all the proper safety gear. Now they stick mostly to charter boats and to spreading a message to anyone who will listen. The main thing that we learned was preemptively having that e -pub. I mean, just going anywhere outside of the river. If I can't see land on it <laughs> one side of me, it's time to have an e -pub. And some of the local uh, uh, boating safety warehouses told us that they had never sold so many uh, emergency position indicating radio, radio beacons after that, as they had after that case. Captain Andy Bloom says having one of these to alert the Coast Guard when you're in trouble is the difference between three hours in the water and three days. Unfortunately, is they did everything wrong. They, they, it was almost like they worked hard not to be found uh, because they failed to file a float plan with anyone saying we're going in this area. Um, so we did that, 
uh, right away, as I mentioned, opens up our search. They went offshore and they started out wearing their life jackets, but it was warm, so they took them off. And he hopes anyone who goes out on the water learns from John, Becca, and Elias's nightmare. If you have a life jacket on, we are four times more likely to find you than if you don't. Four times. And something else. Do you think they should have stayed with the boat? Well, uh, we always recommend staying with the boat because if we find the boat, then we found the people, and the boat is the easiest thing to find. Considering the odds stacked against them, John and Elias's parents say their survival can only be explained one way. Someone was not going to let them die. Well, and I said, no, nope, Chris is not letting it happen. You know, it was 21 months, and no, it's not going to happen. John, Becca, and Elias were lost at sea 21 months to the day that the brother's youngest sibling, Chris, was killed in a motorcycle accident. 21 was also Chris's favorite number. For their family, it was more than a coincidence. And little brother look out for them, and then he did. Do you think it was a miracle that you were found? Yeah. I mean... Absolutely. The minute we hit the water, I knew we were going to get rescued. That's the first thing I said. It was like, look, they're going to find us. It's just a matter of time. A father who never gave up hope that he'd see his daughter again. And a brother who couldn't stop kicking. There was several, probably several times where I said I could probably just quit now and, and stop. But, I, you know, something in the back of my head, I, I just couldn't. It's just not me. And a mother who fought through the exhaustion with one goal constantly in her mind a dream she's now living. I have my daughter with me, and I love every minute I spend with her. Um, but I guess I just try not to, I try not to think too much into it. I embrace what happened, and you know, I'm glad it was part of my life. Three fishermen who say their nightmare at sea reminds them every day of what makes life worth living. All the kicking, all the screaming, all the drinking, all the not being able to drink, all the holding on to the cooler, all the not losing the cooler, all the fighting the shark, watching the dolphin, everything was worth it because now we get to spend the rest of our lives with our family. The Coast Guard says that it searched the equivalent to the size of the state of Maryland during those three days. John and Becca, they still have their blue cooler. The handles are missing on it, and it's pretty beaten up, but they say they just don't have the heart to get rid of it. I asked them if there was something about that morning when they were heading out that was a sign to them that they should have turned back. They both said yes. They said it was when Elias started singing the theme song to Gilligan's Island. They say he jinxed them. After all, the name of the boat that they were borrowing that day it was called The Problem Child. I'm Jennifer Waugh. Thank you for watching Lost at Sea, The Untold Story. Stay connected to WJXT Channel 4, 24-7 from anywhere in the world.